obviously the most important job is this is the lovely Tony in them, and I think you want to go around. Um, we are going to have uh, drinks in the interval, and then there's an after party. So at the interval, if you pick up a flyer, you will know where to go. I hope you can join us, those over 80. <laughs> um, so we start with uh, Elgar's violin sonata. Uh, he lived from 1857 to 1934. And he was a typically sort of English composer, particularly now we think of him as typically English, but actually many of his influences were European, and I think it sits very well with the Franck in the second half, and we have an English first half with a short piece by Evelyn Wallen, who we're very pleased to see here. Um, uh, Algar always felt that he was a bit of, an <laughs> a bit of an outsider. Um, he had very humble origins. His dad was... Uh, um, piano tuner and ran music, a sheet music and instrumental shop. And he always felt, especially once he sort of achieved recognition, that he didn't really deserve it and had that classic English class thing going on. Um, between 1914 and 25, he made a series of recordings of his own works, conducting most of them himself. And he's been described as the first composer who took the gramophone seriously. Uh, which is kind of interesting because until the gramophone became regularly available, everybody used to clap after every movement. And uh, many people, many composers, judged the piece's success by how much clapping they got after each movement. And now it's very sort of like you get very sneered at if you um, clap after each movement. And they do think that this is largely because the gramophone was the first opportunity for people to listen to a whole piece, several movements without any sort of interruption in the privacy of their own home and feel that this was what the piece should feel like and that kind of made its way into the concert hall. Um, so we won't be clapping in between the movements as well. Um, Elga was born in a small village just outside of Worcester. Uh, he was a violinist, his father was a violinist of professional standard although he didn't play for a living. And he and all of his siblings received an extremely musical upbringing Elgar was proficient on violin and piano, which is, I'm sure, why this piece is so great to play for both of us, because uh, he knew exactly what it would be like to play both parts. Um, he had his, his heart set on going to the conservatory in Leipzig, but uh, his family couldn't afford for him to go, so he never received a formal music training. At the age of 22, he was appointed bandmaster at the Worcester and County Lunatic Asylum, <laughs> Which must have been quite interesting. Um, he, uh, the band was made up of staff, not as we would call them now, patients, and as they called them then, inmates. Uh, but they uh, did a, a dance for all of the um, inmates every Friday night, and uh, Elgar was paid for every dance that he wrote, so he, he sort of honed his skill during this time. He was there for five years, and he did a lot of uh, strange arranging because it was a bit of a weird mix of instruments in this band and, um, and, and got paid per polka. Uh, he worked for five years. Um, during the 1890s, his reputation as a composer grew gradually. He made his name chiefly through choral works and in the late 1890s got a publisher, Novello and Co, which is a big deal. Um, he also wrote the very beautiful Serenade for Strings in 1892 uh, which I'd love to play you, but unfortunately we don't quite have this space. Um, his big hit was the Enigma Variations, written in 1899, which received huge acclaim for its originality and charm, as well as being extremely beautiful to listen to. This, more than any of his other works, established him as the preeminent British composer of his generation. In 1904, Covent Garden presented a three-day festival of Elgar's works, uh, an honour never bestowed before on an English composer. The king and queen attended the first concert and liked it so much they came back the next night uh, for the premiere of the Apostles. Uh, it was the dream of Gerontius on the first night. Tonight's programme actually features all composers who have had premieres attended by the king or queen. <laughs> um, and apparently when Erelyn's piece was played, the queen was tapping her foot, which I think is extremely high royal praise. Um, Elgar was knighted shortly after the festival happened and finally sort of relaxed into feeling that he was not a, a fake uh, and that his, his success was real. Uh, he's, he was always very insecure, as I said, and um, fame was a bit of a mixed blessing. He didn't really like the loss of privacy, although he was um, happy to have some money, and um, he complained often of ill health. Uh, as he approached 50, he wrote his first symphony, 
and it was a huge success. It was performed over 100 times in its first year. Um, his violin concerto was commissioned by Chrysler, who was still is very famous, but was one of the most famous violinists of the time. It was written in 1910, and uh, is unlike his cello concerto, which sort of fell flat strangely to us now that Jacqueline Dupre made it such a huge hit, everybody knows it now, but at the time it wasn't played more than once in its first year. Uh, in the later years of his life, uh, 1918, Elgar wrote the violin sonata that we're going to play you. Uh, it was written at the same time as his piano quintet in A minor and string quartet in E minor. All three works were very well received and he continued to be popular in Britain, although not, as, not so popular elsewhere in the world. His music was falling out of fashion by the 1920s, although he was still strongly admired by particularly the music fraternity. The death of his wife El um, Alice caused Elgar to really lose sight of his passion for composing. He did do a little bit, but really uh, he sort of stopped there. He became very depressed and um, did a few arrangements, but his most productive years were over. Uh, that's when he turned to the recording from 1926 onwards, an HMV, which I didn't know until this afternoon, stands for His Master's Voice, uh, which refers to the little dog that you see listening to the gramophone, um, had been commissioning his work since 1914. But in 1925, the development of the electrical microphone made uh, recording a call work or a large symphony suddenly possible as it hadn't been before. Um, he, rec he recorded all of his major works, including the violin and cello concertos, and you can buy them on CD. I, don't, I should have brought them to ask you, <laughs> but I haven't. Um, as he came close to his death, his music uh, experienced a welcome revival. The BBC organised a festival of works to celebrate his 75th birthday, and in 1933 he flew to Paris, having been asked to conduct the violin concerto for Yehudi Menuhin, obviously another stellar violinist of the time. Uh, he was commissioned by the BBC to write a third symphony, which was sadly never completed due to his ill health. Uh, I like to think he must have died a relatively happy man, as his music <coughs> was once again being recognised as fantastic by both his peers and his public. It remains an enduring favourite in Britain particularly, partly for its almost uncanny ability to sound like England. Nobody can explain why it sounds like rolling green hills, but somehow it does. Uh, I really love this work. It's been such a pleasure to prepare it for you. I hope you enjoy it as much as I will. Uh, it's in three movements, with the first movement beginning in A minor and taking quite a long time to get to the real key of E minor. Uh, it's a restless movement, it's quite bitty, quite nervy, it doesn't have the big tunes that we see in the finale, we just see the kind of beginnings of them. Uh, the romance, the second movement, is, is lazy, quite sensual, with the Spanish element of rhythm and colour that Elgar had um, it developed early in his career and then left behind, so we, we only see it in his early work. Um, the last movement is the big tune of the sonata, and uh, Elgar said it was very broad and soothing, which I hope you'll agree with. Um, it's fantastically sort of expansive, beautiful to play, and um, a joy. I hope you enjoy it.